Good day, Carrie. How's it going? Good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, <clears throat> so, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and <laughs> and what you do and yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, so my name is Carrie Ridzinski. Um, I'm a performance poet yeah. um, and published author and cool. um, human being. <laughs> and um, I'm sober. And I'm an introvert, and I'm an adventurer. Cool, cool. It's a wide array of different, yep. different things. Those are some things about me. <laughs> uh, so you were at the uh, AWF this past weekend. Yeah, I was yep. performing on Friday night in the only poetry showcase that was on at the festival this year yep. called Ten to Here. Yeah. Cool. What was it called then? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Grace Taylor came up with that name. So Grace was one of, was the person who created the idea of the show. Um, and I think she wanted to create an environment that explored what it meant to be tender. Mm -hmm. And this idea of, um, yeah, how do we exp use tenderness and also creating a more intimate cipher type showcase cool. um, so that it wasn't so much, oh, here's this person standing behind a mic at a podium reading, yeah. but more connecting with the audience. Um, and the, the idea of the show was that one person would kind of jump off the last idea of the last person and jump off the next idea of that person kind of thing. Um, and so we didn't actually write the poems in that way, but we st we st read through all the poems and structured them so that they kind of told a story as you went right. through the show. Cool, cool. Um, and connected them in that way. And it seemed to work absolutely brilliantly. It was oh, like cool. almost seamless, and, and particularly the piece you're talking about a lone poet standing behind a mic. Mm. And so you end up with eight poets. Mm. That particular theme and how you guys did that, it was like, one show mm. with these these actors or performers in it. Mm. That's how it struck me. Yeah, we weren't um, when we actually came up with the the idea. I don't think Grace intended for people to clap in between poems, but I'm actually quite glad the audience did clap between poems. Um, but they were meant to just kind of seamlessly flow into each other, which was a cool idea. So mm -hmm. we all explored tenderness and Grace specifically wrote pieces that kind of um, jumped into what uh, more specifically looking at what does tender mean that it doesn't have to be soft that yeah. it can be many kinds of tender true, yeah true. but I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself in your question no 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 that's cool um how long did it take to rehearse all of that Actually, we <coughs> didn't get together to rehearse too much. Um, so we had uh, we had one initial planning meeting. So first, she gave us a brief yeah. that said, "Hey, this is what the show's about," but it was still pretty vague. We were all yeah. a little like, "What do we do?" So yeah. she gave us a little bit more information and a rough idea of how many poems we should each bring to the show, which was three different poems. Okay. Um, then we had a planning meeting with Kyla, Dietrich, Grace, and I. So four of the six people. Um, and we came up with the idea of the opening and the closing, which mm -hmm. were um, where we were all voiced different things kind of woven together. Yeah. Um, and we discussed a bit of like what the poems were that we were thinking of doing in the show. We had maybe like a four hour meeting about a week ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where we came up with the order and the structure of the show and we read through the entire thing. And then Dietrich and I wrote a group piece for the show. We were the only duet in the show. Mm -hmm. So we spent um, a, a couple hours, maybe we wrote that piece in maybe two hours together. Oh, wow. We'd each written pieces and we brought them together and we weaved them together in about two yeah. hours. And then we did about another two hour rehearsal. And then we had another two hour rehearsal before the show. So oh, on, no. to be honest, it wasn't that much rehearsing. Yeah. But we did actually put a lot of time and energy into it. It wasn't like we could just show up and not know what mm, we were doing. True. And true. I memorized all of my pieces, so that took me a couple hours to do. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You're a bit of a natural. Uh, I've been performing for 14 years now, so oh, yeah. like yeah. I have um, a funny thing that I used to do back in 2013, 2014. I was on a couple international final stages for slam competitions. Yeah. And I would write a piece the day of final stage, memorize it, 
and then perform it in front of like a thousand people. Whoa. And so that was like a thing I kind of became known for a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I just did it a couple times and people were like, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I kind of lost my confidence a bit with memorizing for a couple of years. I just had like a, a time when I dropped a poem in the middle of a performance and it just really Jeez. shook my confidence. Right. Right. Um, and so this year has been kind of nice because I did a show in the Auckland Fringe that was all memorized. And then this show, I did everything memorized. And those, I think, have kind of helped me regain my confidence. But it is actually really, it's really easy for me to memorize quite quickly. Yeah. So I think my second piece um, that I did, which is called Love Me Like a Teenage Girl, mm -hmm. um, it took me an hour to memorize that wow. piece. Wow. And these are quite substantial pieces. They're not yeah, like they're, they're three one minutes or two like, stanzas. Yeah, yeah, they're three minutes, so they're about three pages long. Mm -hmm. Dietrich's poem of mine, which was really funny, um, on Thursday night I hadn't memorized it the night before the show. Yeah. I went over to his house, we started practicing, we practiced for an hour, I memorized it during our practice, during the hour. Friday night during the show, he forgot a couple lines, yeah. but I knew yeah. his lines, yeah. so I said his lines yeah. for him. Yeah. And I was just really lucky, there's probably just one part of the poem I wouldn't have been able to remember. So that was just, yeah, it's just from years and years of practicing, years and yeah. years of performing. It just kind of becomes, once you start trusting yourself again, I think that that becomes easier. True, true. And um, what's your process for memorizing the poems that you like? Because I know some people, in order to, you know, um, capture something in their memory and keep it there, they, they tend to chew gum. Mm. Or they don't. Oh, no, I don't do that. No, no, no you don't do yeah. that? No? No, um, well, I always, I always tell my students, my poetry students, and I didn't have either of you in poetry class at MIT. But, Spoken um, word. You have me in spoken word, yes. So I often say that um, when the easiest way to memorize your poem is to fall in love with it while you're writing. Yeah. And if you already like the piece, and if you're already like, oh, I can't wait to say this out loud, it's going to be a lot easier for you to memorize. Um, and then I break it down by chunks, like by, yeah. um, and I write in quite short lines and short stanzas. Yeah. So maybe taking half of a stanza, repeating those four lines several times out yeah. loud to myself, and then doing it without the paper before I add anything else on. Wow. And I do the whole poem that way. And so yeah. some sections are really easy, some sections are a struggle. <laughs> what do you, how, how do you get past the struggle? Uh, I think just keep saying it. Like I, I yeah. say it when I'm driving in my car. I say yeah. it when I'm in the shower. True. Um, true. I write all my poems out after I've memorized them. Okay. I'm quite yeah. a visual yeah, yeah, learner, yeah. and so visually picturing the paper in my mind and just writing it really mm. helps me. I do that for both group pieces and individual pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I think I think more than anything though, you just have to start trusting yourself and trusting yeah. the poem. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That, that process of mem memorization, mm. um, having done your spoken word class, yeah. I seem to, it sort of reminds me of part of that process being practiced in there or being taught to us. Mm. You know, particularly you take a couple of lines and you get that s square off and then yeah. you build on that and you actually perform that stanza. Yeah. And so the embedding. Yeah of it in terms of memory, but also probably a lot of the performance of it too comes at the same time. Yeah, I think so. I think you're learning the poem while you're memorizing it. And then if you're lucky enough, you have the time to break yourself from the cadence that you've learned it in. So we have to memorize in a specific way. And that's not always the best way to perform the poem. So something that I've been struggling with my current spoken word students is they don't memorize before they come to class. Yeah and then they expect to just rehearse and do that in class. But they should actually be elevating their performance when they're in class, and we haven't gotten to that stage because they're not doing the work outside of class. Right, you know, right. So it's like you've got to lift weights in order to be in the weightlifting competition. Yeah, you know? yeah, And yeah. so you've got to practice basketball before you come to the game. True. And it's the same thing with memorizing. I see the memorizing as part of the practice, and then you come to the game and that's when we start elevating, we start fixing all those techniques, we start looking at your facial expressions and your hand gestures and all of that kind of stuff is what should be happening in class. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, in an ideal world. Well, speaking of, uh, of <coughs> teaching, uh, yeah. so you are a uh, uh, poetry teacher at MIT, right? Yeah, so technically I teach in three departments. 
Right. I'm the yeah. only teacher in creative arts who teaches in three departments at the moment. So I teach okay. in creative writing, and I work with the poetry students on their third year manuscript. Yeah. I teach um, in performing arts, mm. and um, I've actually taught three different classes in performing arts, but my wow. my bread and butter is spoken word yeah and um, and it's the only spoken word class offered at a tertiary level in New Zealand Wow. Um, and uh, I also teach foundation we're in my foundation classroom right. which is a level four creative arts paper and um, do you find there's you have <clears throat> different processes of teaching depending on the discipline that you are teaching uh, I mean you're teaching different stuff but I probably have a similar approach approach right. a bit you know right. I think I'm myself when I'm in True. I hope in the classroom you know so I'm going to bring what I feel comfortable doing and exercises that I like doing to my students yeah so even though poetry isn't a part of this level four paper we are looking at improving our writing and our language so I often put poetry exercises into the activities that we do cool. because that's what I know best True. right so it's yeah. easiest for me to slip in a poetry aspect. Yeah. You know, well, you um, work with what you've got. Yeah, you yeah. work with what you got. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously what you're teaching is different, but um, the students are different as well. The True. students in foundation are very different than the students in performing yeah, arts, are very course, different course. than the students in creative writing. So, yeah, yeah as they would. Yeah. yeah. I, and I always liked that spoken word brought together the creative writing and the performing mm -hmm. students. Um, and a couple classes, I think, used to do that really well. Um, yeah. My performing identity class that I taught in 2017 had classes had people from all three disciplines visual artists yeah. took that paper yeah. as well which was really cool yeah, yeah I remember that yeah yeah um in terms of uh <coughs> your spoken word classes um so I, I never took one of your your classes you know, I know as yeah. we all know <laughs> <laughs> um but I, I did always notice something before you guys would uh, you know do your performance out in the the foyer mm -hmm. um I'd always, I'd look out the window and I'd see you all doing like this, uh, a dance or, or some breathing techniques and stuff. Uh, <laughs> you want to tell us what that's all about? Yeah, so for spoken word class, um, Marcus was, had to do a lot of this. Um, yeah. I make everybody warm up their bodies and warm right. up their voices. Okay. Um, like you would in like a voice class or something yeah. because spoken word is about a physical performance, yeah. a vocal performance on top of the written word that you've created. Right. So it's blending all these different things that we do. Um, and so we would warm up our voices and our faces and our bodies so that we were ready to come to the stage and be able to use our diaphragms appropriately, use our breath right. appropriately, um, and also just be like awake and loose, you know? Because if yeah. you're nervous and you've been sitting you're not going to give a great physical performance where you're gesturing and making eye contact and stuff like that. So True. you want to be thinking about that stuff. And sometimes people got a little goofy, but yeah. I think sometimes that's fun. And yeah, whatever's, yeah, whatever's working for the course, each yeah. group is very different. Yeah. Marcus's course was very different than the following year, which is very different. This year's the youngest kind of cohort. Right. Um, and how are they different? So oh, they're just uh, the dynamics within each course are different. Okay. So, like yeah. the maturity or the commitment or the type of work. Right, Marcus's right. group was a really great group because there was um, a lot of creative writers in that class, yeah. and so the level of writing that was happening was. Um, I I think I prefer selfishly to teach creative writers to perform, because right. I'm a creative writer yeah. who learned to perform. Right. And I get frustrated when people say, oh, you're a performance poet. Yeah. And it's like, well, no, I'm a published author. <laughs> yeah. um, and I started out writing, and I just happened to learn and work on my technique and my craft. I wasn't a performer who just started writing poems. True. True. And right now, spoken word is sitting in performing arts. So I have performers who are learning to write instead right. of writers right. who are learning to perform. And I can, do, I can teach both ways, but yeah. I think just because of my background, I prefer teaching creative writers to perform. Mm, fair enough, fair enough. Can I just ask a yeah. question a bit coming back to the uh, Auckland Writers Festival? Totally. At the show, um, the, the theme of the left rib, or oh, the yeah. rib kept getting mm -hmm. 
mm. um, mention, I think, by just about every poet except for yourself, but, but I think you did make reference to I did rib. say a rib line, yeah, but my new poem. it wasn't the left rib, as no, I'd yeah. heard just about everyone else was specifically referring. Mm. What's, what's that about, if you wouldn't mind? I can't speak for what other people are writing. There was a joke in the American slam scene for a long time about rib cage being an overused image okay. in poetry, but... Um, I have a line where I say, I break off your favorite rib and put it back inside of me, um, which to me was like kind of this playful reference of Adam and Eve and mm -hmm. this idea of man and woman being connected and this idea of me taking what I want from you and, and having a piece of you inside of me. Um, yeah, the, that piece that I wrote is meant to be playful. It's meant to be uh, kind of a hy hyperbolic and it's and it's how it's talking. So I don't know if I can speak to everyone else's use of ribs, but I think there is something about that part of the body. The left side would be close to your heart um, as well. So there yeah. might be something like poetic about that that we feel connected to. Mm. Yeah. And it did work with the poem. Mm. It was a it was a fun poem. Cool. You <laughs> That's know, and good. they sort of references they did have that that metaphorical or even a, a bit more of a deeper meaning than just the fun on the surface mm, of it, yeah. know, like sort of suggesting. Yeah. I, I, I think a lot of us got it. The other thing about that particular thing was we attended the uh, poetry showcase last year and I was yeah. with you and Ken mm -hmm. and it was in the big auditorium yeah. and stuff and then we were in the Heartland room this time around yeah. and it was like a totally different atmosphere, different venue. Yeah. How does the, that sort of venue and, and the intimacy or otherwise play mm. towards the poet and the performances? I think it had a huge impact this year to change the venue. So first I should say that last year the showcase that you saw was called Best of the Best. And um, that was the second year that Best of the Best had happened. And Best of the Best actually replaced not that it can replace, but took the place of Poetry Idol, which mm. had run for 10 years and that had ended and so best of the best came twice and they decided not to do another big poetry showcase this year and uh grace kind of pitched them this idea of a more intimate um night of poetry that wasn't on a big you know high pressure stage so i think it worked and you could fit about 250 people in that room and the night was sold out i think if there were any empty seats there were for people who either didn't claim their tickets or were writers who had reserved seats who didn't end up coming because for the writers festival as a writer you reserve tickets that you want yeah. to go to but you might not actually end up going so yeah, yeah. um so yeah so that was really cool that i think that the switch in venue was so important that giant auditorium that we were in last year for Best of the Best Showcase to watch is huge. It's massive. The, the poet is very far away. And also, the lights were still on, um, so the audience was lit up. And I understood why they decided to do that, because I think it helps the poet feel more connected to the audience. But it became this big cavern. It was really hard to connect with them. It didn't yeah. feel intimate. And this year, with the dark, like, moody jazz bar feel of the Heartland Room I think really lent itself to the purpose of the show anyway and also the audience was like crying uh, we had I, I hugged like 25 people I didn't know afterwards <laughs> so it was definitely this bonding <coughs> connection that I think wouldn't have happened if we'd been in a different room mm. for sure yeah no I, I felt that in amongst all the people that I was sitting amongst mm. Just it, every poem and every poet there was really heartfelt comment and murmuring and oh, stuff, cool. and I knew that the connection was really happening. Nice. And I think that's what helped make the show for me, too. Mm. The other thing I just want to touch on, Carrie. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> probably a little bit left field. I'd attended a few other uh, events prior to that, and uh, I noted that almost everyone in the room, or Good ninety percent of them are all gold card. Mm. And Does that mean older? Yeah, gold yeah, yeah, card yeah. people. Okay, cool. yeah. And when we were <laughs> when we were in the poetry room, yeah, it was a totally different age group, different, you yeah. know, particularly in the age ranges is what yes. I noticed. Yes. I don't want to start a controversy <laughs> on your on oh. your website, <laughs> but I will say that. 
Aqua Writers Festival knows that their spoken word events reaches a different demographic than the, than the actual festival mm -hmm. itself. Um, and I know that because they've said that to me. Um, and I do think that people are aware of performance poetry events and poetry events reaching that different, different mm -hmm. demographic, different ages, different mm -hmm. backgrounds, different class range, et cetera. And it should be a more affordable night. Um, and it should uh, be able to be accessible to people of different experiences. So um, I think that that's why it's essential to have that. I wish that there are other events reach that same demographic. Um, and I think that there's conversations to have about why it doesn't and how it could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I think it worked brilliantly. I'd like to go mm -hmm. next year to the same venue. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that's good. I mean, you could email the Auckland Heritage yeah, no, Festival and tell them. Certainly will. Yeah. I thought it worked really well. I think it's important for them to hear from the audience, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I think so often we go home and we say, oh, this is what I liked or this is what I didn't like. But imagine if we all actually emailed them and said, yo, this is what we <laughs> need more of, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. yeah. They should have more emerging writer things as well. But the Auckland Writers Festival is very different than other festivals I've been to in New Zealand. Christchurch Word Festival is very innovative and uh, creative in a very different way. Um, still reaches, has an international reach, but I think Auckland Writers Festival has the certain prestige and international acclaim um, that changes who they end up bringing to the, to the festival. True, yeah. true. It's a good panel of stuff on this year. Yeah. One, one other question before you yeah. finish. Um, Poetry styles between American poets and Kiwi poets. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed any sort of difference in either performance or the actual poem, uh, content of the poems? Or the yeah, I think I quite like, um, I really love New Zealand poetry um, and I love American poetry. Um, I find British and Australian poetry kind of have some similarities. There's a lot, of, specifically in spoken word that they rhyme a lot, and rap mm. is a big influence in those situations. And I'm not, not that I don't like it, but I'm not as big of a fan of the Australian-British kind of persuasion versus, excuse me, um, that's my sneeze. <laughs> my students make fun of me. Um, I quite like New Zealand-American performance poetry. I think that New Zealanders still have a lot of authenticity um, when it comes to performance poetry that has somehow been oversaturated in America, um, and America has been kind of oversaturated by button poetry and other like online forums where a lot of the poems can sound the same and the styles can sound the same. Whereas if I go to Nelson and hear Bush poetry, which I have, it sounds very different than the pun poetry of Wellington versus the political poetry of Auckland versus the um, kind of storytelling nature of Christchurch. So yes. I think different regions have different uh, styles and different topics that they write about. Sure. Um, I run the National Poetry Slam in New Zealand um, in November every year. And so I get the privilege of getting to hear poets from all over the country in that setting. And then I also tour quite a bit. So I get to go, I used to run um, Nelson's finals or and I featured at Christchurch's finals last year for specifically for Poetry Slam. Ooh. So um, I get to go into those cities and hear those poets performing and hear what their styles are like. And yeah, I think, I think that they're still holding on and developing their own Kiwi style, mm. um, which, is, which I love. Cool. Yeah. Um, just quickly going back to uh, <clears throat> talking about American poetry. Um, so obviously you're American. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what actually, if it's not too personal of a question, um, what, what made you decide to make the move from, from America to, to New Zealand? And, and where are you from over there as well? Um, well, I grew up in Illinois, which I talked yep. about in my, the first poem um, I wrote for the show. I actually wrote the, my first piece for Long Distance Phone Calls, um, which was the Occam Fringe show I did. Yeah. Um, and that poem's called The American, and it's talking about that whole 
idea of distance, where you come from, and being yeah. far away from home and your identity. So I grew up in Illinois, northern Illinois, um, and my parents lived in the same house for 30 years, but they've wow. now sold that house, and it feels a bit like my identity is confused mm. about what that means. Yeah. Um, I left Illinois when I was 18, so 14 years ago. Um, and so it's weird when people say, where are you from? Yeah. It's like, well, this is where I grew up, but I haven't lived there in 14 years, so sure. is that still where I'm from? Sure. And I think that that's something that I'm constantly trying to grapple with. So I've lived in every time zone in America. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there are four of them. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> and I was last living in LA before I moved here. Um, my partner uh, and I, we were just friends when we first traveled here and we fell in love while we were traveling here. And uh, it was just kind of like this dream to always yeah. come back and see if we could live here for a bit. And we had some poetry friends um, like Dietrich and Grace Taylor. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to kind of give it a go and be part of this community. Cool. Uh, it wasn't easy to move here, yeah. but Literally. we did it. And yeah. um, and I came here with like literally a backpack and a suitcase, yeah. and I've been here four years. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, I didn't expect to stay here this long. Mm. And uh, so how did how did you get into the teaching at uh, at MIT? Oh, funny enough, um, Tusiata Avia is really the reason that. Um, I teach here is yeah. um, Tusiata recommended I kind of help out with relieving her for some classes that she okay. was teaching cool. and then she was developing the spoken word class yeah. and so she had both Ken and I my partner Ken and I come uh, in to help her develop the course and we gave her tons of resources and helped structure it mm. um, and then she had a lot of traveling that she was doing. This was in 2016. And so I actually subbed all of the classes that she was gone for. And wow. then she had some family emergency stuff happen. So I yeah. actually taught the rest of the class. So she only yeah. taught this small portion of the yeah. class and I taught the rest. So I, that put my foot in the door in MIT. Yeah. And then it was, I just kept getting phone calls like, oh, well, could you teach this class or could you teach this cool. class for cool. us kind of thing. And awesome. Yeah. Good. I just want to one that yeah. comes back to a line I heard in one of your poems and mm -hmm. I really like the line it was like I've worked six years as a waitress now I'm yeah. working down in South Auckland yeah. and I've not been able to buy myself a new wardrobe in ten years yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's that like statement about I just love it I think oh thanks you know um can I talk a bit about that poem? Sure. Is that okay? So yeah. I, I went on a writer's retreat recently. Um, my partner and I booked ourselves a, a place with no internet, no uh, cell service, no, no TV. The plugs didn't even work. <laughs> like, it was so off the grid. Like, well. And so I ended up writing in my notebook, and I knew I wanted to write a new piece. And I was trying to not edit myself. I was trying not to judge myself for the things that I was writing down. And I started writing, like, what's the most ridiculous thing I'm thinking? How could I hype myself up? How could I tell people things about myself that I wouldn't normally say? And so I started writing lines like that one. And the line is, I lived on a waitress salary for six years, and now I teach in South Auckland. So I'm still wearing the clothes I bought a decade ago. <laughs> I'm thrifty, but I have expensive taste in breakfast. Yeah. So that's the, that's the line. And I think that line, uh, for me, represents this idea that, um, to me, hard work is sexy. Like, hard work is the most appealing thing about other people to me. Mm -hmm. It's that thing that makes me appreciate like other humans. Mm -hmm. um, and this idea that as a poet, sometimes I've lived completely off of my art and sometimes I've had to work the worst job. You know, yeah. I've cleaned cars, like I've done, <laughs> I've done the work, you know? And I, I didn't mind being a waitress, but it wasn't like I was rolling in the dough. Um, there was a year where I lived under the poverty line in America and what was considered enough money to be above the poverty line. Um, and so I was just kind of like doing what I had to do to live on my own terms. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that that line for me was this idea that, you know, I've done the work and I'm still here. And even though I don't make enough money, like I still like who I am and I'm not going to compromise myself 
mm. for that, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 And I think as, as artists, we have to sacrifice some things about ourselves, or about, about like, um, we might have to sacrifice things that, you know, might be nice otherwise. But I don't know, it just depends on what, what, how you're living your life, and yeah, and that's how I'm living my life. Can't be an artist if you're filthy wealthy, can you? It's <laughs> <laughs> an interesting question. It's an interesting question. The Gorilla Girls have an exhibit on at the Auckland Art Gallery, so it was cool to see all of their poster art and um, all their political statements and their feminism and calling people out on wealth and inequality yeah. and racism and, yeah, they're yeah. dope. Yeah. Those are all things that are around uh, the around our world, and I guess the creative aspect of it is how we actually look at them. Yeah. Mm, True. Um, <clears throat> so before we wrap up, is there anything you'd? Uh, oh, actually, sorry. Um, so what have you got planned in the future? Oh, in the future. Yeah. Man, I'm busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but. Specifically for poetry. Yep. Um, so at the end of last year, I I had been working full time at MIT, and uh, I taught nine courses last year, which is mm. too many. Um, yep. And I realized that I was really depleted artistically, and yep. I wanted to focus on what artistic goals I had. And so I remember I was on an airplane, and I was just so down and I said I'm just gonna write out my what are the dream artistic things that I want to do next year and I wrote down my artistic goals for 2019 and there were 46 of them and I was wow. like wow I have wow. been neglecting <laughs> yeah. things that I've wanted to do so I've I've steadily been marking things off my list yeah. um, I want to publish a new book um, I want to put out a new spoken word album. Yep. I've done two before, but I haven't done one in a long time. Um, and I'd like to make a music video kind of thing for a, for an, a, for a track of the album. Wow. Um, but some things, those are some goals yep. and some things I have actually planned. Um, on Friday, I'm speaking at and teaching at a national youth conference. Um, and on June 8th, I'm running an all day, nine hour writing performance poetry workshop at Nathan Homestead. Whoa, oh, really? Whoa. Yeah, so um, I did a two-day one uh, last month in March. Mm -hmm. I don't know what month it is. In March, <laughs> and um, <laughs> end of March, uh, the weekend of graduation. Yeah. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> and that was really cool. Some people flew up from Taranaki and Wanganui to come to the cool. workshop, which was really cool. 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 So we compiled that into a one-day workshop um, on June 8th. Um, and I'll be touring later this year for my, um, I wrote a feminist spoken word show that I've toured in the past and we're bringing it back with new poems. It's called How We Survive. Um, and it's uh, just me and another woman whose name is Olivia Hall. Yeah. So we're going to be doing that later this year. Cool, cool. And so how do people uh, uh, get tickets to go along and check? Check all that out. Um, the best thing to do is for people to follow my Facebook page. Yeah, please. Self plug. <laughs> um, Carrie Rudzinski, R U D Z I N S K I. Um, so I post a lot of my show information yep. up on my Facebook page, and we will make a How We Survive Facebook page in the coming months for all of our tour dates cool. and things cool. like that. Yeah. Awesome. And we can link all this stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. For, for sure. sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, before we wrap up, you have any final comments you want to gonna plug anything? Oh, I kind of did just plug myself, didn't I? <laughs> anything else you want to plug? Um, you can <laughs> find me on Instagram yep. under Splinter Cheek. Cool. Um, I guess, like, just kind of a final thought would be, I don't know, I think it's really important for art to be experienced live and in person. Um, whether that's like in an art gallery or at a concert or at a poetry reading, um, and I don't know. I just I wish that mm, I think I think I feel really lucky that so much of my uh, social life and social experiences yeah. are through this poetry community and live yeah. art. And I see kind of an extraordinary amount of live art, and I want other people to have those same kind of experiences. So I think as humans we connect on a different level when you have that intimacy 
of, of sharing that in live spaces. Yeah. Um, and the importance of artists collaborating, like you guys are. Yeah. Like, that's so, that's that's live art, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, that's yeah. you, you collaborating in, like, real time. And I think that that, at the end of the day, is, like, the heartbeat of what art is about. Exactly. It's about human connection. Yeah, for sure. And that's what I want to leave you with. Cool. Nice thought. <laughs> The first time you tell your parents there is a name for what you are, it is on the dark ride down the stretch of I-90 between Chicago and the dying town from which you are from. You say, straight edge, and your voice is a sharp blade in a shaking hand. You say, anomaly, and your father says nothing. Your loneliness, a new hurt. You will say, I don't drink, so many times in your life it will become your name, sober. Sober face, sober girl, that other girl, her body of wallpaper, her body a corner of hurt, that girl can't just say yes, can't just fit in, can't help making everyone uncomfortable, can't help always being uncomfortable, can't just shut up and act like she belongs here, that girl whose mouth is fine china, ain't never had a hangover, ain't never blacked out, that girl without addiction, aren't you just a joke? Aren't you everything they don't want you to be? Some kind of mirror everyone keeps breaking. There will never be a day in your life in which alcohol does not participate in. You will be asked why, repeatedly, as if there needed to be a reason, as if you could somehow be explained away, as if wanting something too much is better than not wanting anything at all. You are 16 when your mother tells you your grandfather is an alcoholic. It will be years before she ever admits to anything else, how she wants you to love him and not think of his anger and his hands and his mouth. It is the night of your prom, and you are standing at the, at the edge of a cornfield littered with beer bottles in the dark. The boy you have loved more than yourself is 18 and an alcoholic. He does not drink when he is with you, and you know this must mean he loves you. It is June, and Gi I was stupid, and it was June, and Giselle calls to tell you she woke up at a party without her clothes on and doesn't remember how she got there or what happened to her. It is your first day of college, and you hear Straight Edge for the first time blooming out of the mouth of a boy who has no apology in his body. You are 21, and you have more Straight Edge friends than you ever dreamed of, by which you mean maybe four, and your body is a parade of no, no thank you, no real Really, I'm not joking, I don't drink. It is the summer, you are 23, and a boy kisses you the night he decides to stop being sober. You've spent your life stomaching all of your no, and your sister will accuse you of making her uncomfortable with your silent choices, and that's what you are, and always have been, silent. You do not know what taught you to be this shameful, quiet cavern. You will be this girl for years, and one day you will find your mouth, your beautiful, sober, hype woman mouth, and you will be reborn every time you claim yourself, and you will claim and claim and claim until there is no other name anyone can call you but yes, this girl. Thank you.